So I'm actually going to do anything else. So, good morning. Hi. Good morning. Uh, I was telling all of our, our friends from the art that usually we don't have so many things for adults happening at one time. Um, so we would have people in one room instead of in three rooms. And um, so thank you for coming and thank you for dividing your time between all the important things happening here. And um, it's actually, for me, it's really exciting to have Dawn back in the building because um, for those of you who don't know, Dawn used to be our JCFS liaison. And then when she told us she was moving to the ARC, we were so excited for her and, and so sad for us. Um, but that means that with all the stuff that we do with the ARC, including our high holiday food drive and the, like things ongoing through the year, uh, we get to see Dawn in, in different ways. And um, for those of you who had like it, the dots haven't connected, um, most of the food things that we do here, unless it's um, one of the, like we do Feed the Hungry and Backpack Blessings, but all the other food drives we do are, th are through and with the ARC. Um, so we are very excited to, to get to partner with them all the time. Um, you guys make it so easy. And, um, and we're, we're just, we get a chance to learn a little bit more about what you do and really the clientele that you serve because um, often the things that we do with the ARC happens here and that happens there. So sometimes it's a little hard to figure out what, <laughs> what, the, what the whole picture is. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So I am going to step back and remove my mask. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should do this. Is it okay if I step back and remove my mask? I think I'll have to leave it on. It's okay with me. Okay. Sorry, I just want you to be able to hear me. Thank you. Um, so yes, the ARC has been partnering with Jeremiah long before I was um, involved. And I am Dawn Lieberman. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Education. Um, so I oversee our Volunteer Services Department at the ARC. And with me today, I have Vicki Haas, Dr. Victoria Haas, who is our Clinical Director. And she'll tell you a little bit more about what she does. She works with the um, social services team, with our intensive day program and oversees the client services. And then Stacy Herman, who is our volunteer coordinator. Um, in fact, we have a volunteer program going on after this today with the high school? Sixth through 10th graders. Sixth through 10th graders. They're gonna help us to sort through some of the food that was donated um, that we will then help transport back to our food pantry. It goes directly to clients. So. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ARC. I'm going to ask Vicki to talk a little bit about our clinical services so that really the idea is that you learn a little bit today and you remember this when you're out in your own circles, your family, your friends, your synagogue community, because one of the things, as Rabbi Rachel mentioned, I have been involved in community outreach for many years in different ways. Even when I was working with other organizations and we would suggest that people call the ARC, we often heard, and Vicki knows what I'm going to say, oh, I didn't know they do that there. So we're really trying to educate the community so that we can become a, a top of mind resource. All of the services at the ARC are free. All of the services are confidential. There's a location in West Rogers Park, and very few people know that there is also a location in Northbrook. It's in the back of an, op an office park, intentionally um, hidden among other offices and other businesses. It's more discreet than our West Rogers Park location intentionally. And I'll let Vicki talk a little more about privacy and things like that. Um, if you wanna click to the next slide, I'm gonna just sort of, well, okay. So oh. if you have heard about the ARC, <laughs> what I always just like to ask is what thoughts come to mind if you have any, um, experience or frame of, of reference related to the ARC, I'm happy to hear it. And Rabbi, that includes you. If there's anything that, oh, she's waiting for us here. Oh, there we go, thank you. Um, sometimes we hear, we know they have a food pantry. Sometimes we hear you help the Orthodox community. Anything else? You have a medical clinic, don't you? Yes, okay. yeah, we do. We do, which is located in West Rogers Park, but serves clients from both locations. 
Have I raised one? Anything? You you've listed the things that I've heard about. <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. Yeah. That's that's absolutely great. So you're gonna hear a little bit more. And again, it's you know, there's no quiz at the end, but we do like to share. So Rabbi, I'm gonna have you click to the next slide, please. Thank you. So we always like to start with our mission. So the mission of the art is to help Chicagoland area Jews who are facing adversity to navigate towards self-reliance. Our professionals, volunteers, and donors provide free comprehensive services within a framework within a framework of Jewish values and laws. So one question that we're often asked is, do you have to be Jewish to receive services at the art? Um, the goal is that we're helping households where somebody identifies as Jewish. We are, is it fair to say, we're not asking for proof of this? I'll elaborate on that too. Um, go ahead, go ahead. All right, fine. Um, we serve every Jew, but we serve only Jews. That said, we serve Jewish households. Acknowledging the realities of the Jewish community in our era, we have to, you know, accept the fact that there is a lot of, of intermarriage. So a Jewish household is where one person, one member of the household is Jewish. We accept matrilineal and patrilineal descent. That is a person's mother or father could be Jewish. Um, years ago, at the very beginning of the arc, you know, 50 years ago, we only accepted maternal descent because it was an Orthodox sponsored agency. What happened was in the early 90s, when the Jews from the former Soviet Union were allowed to leave, it was discovered that those who were most discriminated against were those whose fathers were Jewish. Why? Because every person in the former Soviet Union had to have an identity card. And your religion was based on your father's religion. So all of the people who were most discriminated against and wanted to get out first were those whose fathers were Jewish. So we had to accept the reality that these people you know, are Jewish and are having a difficult time because they're Jewish and we needed to be flexible. Um, so we accept matrilineal and patrilineal descent. Um, so I. So is it self-defined Judaism? If they show up and say, I'm Jewish? I, or... will, I, will, I might ask some questions about that. As we get further from the immigrant experience, I mean, it used to be you could say, where did you grow up? And that might tell you, where did you go to shoal? Uh, you know, uh, what like the you, questions what that they, your grandparents that the airport asked you when you right. get to Israel. Right, so, right. Exactly. so it's like the LL, LL security. Start, you know, those kinds of questions of just if, if I actually doubt it. Usually people are pretty sincere, and there's been times where people have you know, slipped through the cracks, so to speak, and we tell them we're happy we were able to help them and, um, you know, give them referrals, and it goes smoothly. Um, that said, we'd rather err on the side of providing service than denying service, and any person who comes to the art, be they Jewish or non-Jewish, We'll meet with our intake social worker, Melinda Strauss, who does nothing but take calls and meet people who come in. And if the person is not Jewish, we will do an intake with them, make calls, provide referrals. We don't turn anyone away from the food pantry ever. So we do provide food. And um, so that's, that's basically how we, how we reconcile it. So what is something like the every five year Pew study or the 10 year JUF study um, that talks about who Jews are and how they define themselves. Right. How and, does and, that and affect? We're actually, we're informed by that population study. In fact, the results of the most recent population study just came out. And what they've discovered is really that the, a lot of the growth now, though it's not huge, are in the Western suburbs where they're the dearth of Jewish services. Um, also, there are more Jews of color, and we're finding that as well as people come to the um, Arab who are Jews of color. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask about that real quick? Sure. So when you say Western suburbs, like what area? Arlington Oak Brook. No, no, Arlington Heights we serve. We don't consider that West. I'm oh, talking okay. like Oak Brook, Vermont, Lyle. Uh, okay. uh, what else is out west? There. And they, there is a large, there's a large enough Jewish population there, is that what you're 
there's an underserved Jewish underserved population. Jewish it's not it's not yeah. huge, but it has grown, and it's where there's been the most growth. That's a relative term, uh -huh. but we still want to be able to reach out to people. We get calls from all over the state. Um, we don't have a tight catchment area, um, but we definitely get calls. Sometimes we can just provide referrals. Sometimes we'll provide one-time financial assistance because they can't have an on ongoing, um, you know, come to the ARC would be too costly and inefficient. So uh, we will often connect them with other services, but there, there's no social workers that they can even find to help find them those services. So we'll still do some case management with them. And Jews of color, what uh, what nationality? Well, there are some Ethiopian Jews here. Um, and also um, there's Rabbi Funye's uh, synagogue that's on the South side. I don't know if you remember, Mich Michelle Obama was cousins with a, a rabbi of color. And um, so there are a couple congregations on the South side. A long, I'm sorry. Go ahead. A long, long time ago, I lived in um, Naperville, mm -hmm. and that is a real upcoming Jewish. Thing. I worked at a synagogue there too. Uh -huh. It was, um, yeah, it, yeah, it, it really it exploded. So, were you Beth Shalom? Yes. Yes. So, I when I worked with JCFS, I was an on-site liaison as I was at Jeremiah at uh, Temple S. Chaim and Lombard. Yes. And it was Rabbi Bob. It was right Long after time. he, oh, okay. he yes. resigned, he retired. Um, so Rabbi Kaznowski, who's been there for years yeah. also. Yeah. That congregation and Beth Shalom and Naperville combined serve over a thousand families. Mm -hmm. And what was always fascinating to me, even at a time where it was about 350, 400 families, they were coming from over 35 different zip codes, not even neighborhoods, but zip codes. So really people were traveling to find, and there is a Chabad in Aurora as well. So yes, Vicki and I want to talk about with the Western suburbs because there, there is a lack of sensitivity to the Jewish community in the social service networks that are there. And the wraparound services that the ARC provides is somebody who came in after been, you know, I've been making referrals for years for congregants. The ARC is the only place that I ever could refer somebody where they had, um, where staff had the background and the knowledge of Jewish culture, where the wraparound services that we call them are provided. So it's not just you come here for financial aid, then you go there for a counseling referral, then you go here to figure out how to feed your family. We're really able to walk clients through all of those steps, even if we can't provide them ourselves. And more so since the pandemic, and I believe still so today, if you call Melinda, the woman that Vicki referenced, and you're looking for a referral or you're calling on behalf of a loved one or family member, you will talk to somebody within 24 hours, if not wow. sooner. And they may receive help within 24 hours of some sort, especially in emergency situations. And I have to say, the capacity in the community and the mental health and social service community is so maxed out, especially since COVID. And I'll ask Vicki to talk a little bit about how we pivoted but I have never made referrals anywhere, Jewish or not, North suburban or city or Western suburbs where somebody is calling a client back that day. Wow. It, unfortunately, it's just not happening. So I'm always proud to say that because I've seen that from both sides. And, and it does, it happens because people are calling often in crisis. That there is a stigma that people feel um, calling the ARC that they feel, you know, I haven't asked you what, you know, you imagine, who you imagine the ARC serves, but one thing that people believe is that it serves people who are impoverished. That's only partially true because everyone can face adversity um, relative to their lives that um, makes it difficult for them to meet all of their, you know, financial or social or emotional needs. Uh, we saw that certainly in, during COVID where it was, was dramatic, um, but people are always in need of services and call when they're in crisis because it's hard to make that call. So we wanna be able to respond. Certainly if someone is food insecure, they don't have enough to eat. Also, if there's a domestic violence situation, uh, we wanna be able to respond right away. We share a, a, um, a grant with Falva 
in Jewish domestic violence agencies to be able to provide their clients with case management and other services, um, especially um, employment services. We have um, an employment department where Andrea Stewart, the director, will write, um, create resumes. They will, she will write them herself. She does interviewing skills and films people so they can see how they do an interview. And sometimes I started here in, at the ARC um, in the middle of the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And I, Thought I had absolutely seen the worst, but COVID um, actually dwarfed that because it impacted everybody. Um, but for employment, there were so many people that were out of work that um, we find that that's a, a service that people use because there's only one way to get out of a difficult financial situation, and that's either getting disability or social security or finding an income through employment. We have a couple of people who get inheritances, but that, that's, that's rare. Um, so uh, why don't you continue with the... Jean, did you unmute to ask a question? Uh, yes, uh, Rabbi, I can't see anyone. All I see is what is the mission of the ARC? Um, can you remove that uh, part? Well, that's fine. Thank you. Hi, Jean. <laughs> <laughs> Now I can see everyone instead of just hearing everyone. So we have actually, Jean, did you want to come? We have a handout, and Jean will email this to you as well, and um, Eileen, um, that talks a little bit about who we help. And I thank you. Yes, it's a little blurry on our screen. So I'm not going to read the statistics to you. I will say, and and thank you. you. Please jump in. You're welcome. Um, one of the things that I think I have heard in the community, and I know that Vicki has, and Stacey will hear more and more, is I didn't realize the art could help me. Or I tried to get my sister to call, but she's worried, actually, she makes too much money. There is a lot of um, misinformation about who we can help and how we are helping them. Also, the fact that 33% of our clients have some form of employment. So sometimes when there's a client in financial crisis, it may be that they need through financial counseling to talk about how and where they're spending. But one thing that I have noticed that's different than I've seen other places is that there is not the approach is very holistic. It's not with judgment. It's really tell me what your your expenses are. Let's talk through it. Um, I think there are some city and government, state and government agencies that might have very strict guidelines to follow. And because we don't receive government funding, we're able to work with the people that it would serve best without being locked into someone having to be maybe at a certain low um, income level as well. Is there anything else you want to say? No, no, that is true. That um, people can have a crisis. We especially see in, in Northbrook, where in Chicago, um, there are many people who are chronically in financial distress and work with our financial counselor, a certified financial counselor, to try to manage and, um, and pay their bills and also save a little bit for emergencies. But what we've noticed in um, Northbrook is that the families that come, their cases are more acute. That is, they've had a serious illness or a job loss. And it's something that brings them to the ARC that um, has shifted in their household and in their income. And then we will try to work with them by providing financial assistance so they don't miss a mortgage payment, by working to find another job, sometimes having to recreate a professional identity. Uh, which happened a lot in the Great Recession, um, and, and now too, where people's jobs have just disappeared. Um, so uh, that's what we see in, in Northbrook. So people get a little self-conscious about coming sometimes, um, or about using the food pantry. There, is, there are very few Jews that will say, I'm hungry, I need food, I don't have food. The stigma is just too great, and people think that they have the money for food because everybody has a little something. We try to reframe use of the pantry as a cost saving technique. Come to the pantry and you will, you know, if you come to the pantry nine months, nine visits over the year, 
you will be able to pay your mortgage or rent a couple times. And that's another way to save. We give a gift card with our pantry orders. We give uh, produce vouchers because our pantry is not that big yet in either location. So we have an agreement with um, Fresh Farms up in Wheeling uh, in the suburbs and then Ted's Market in Chicago. So we do look at, we do try to encourage people to use it. Um, that's why we had to pivot during COVID and we have a drive-through method. So people in Northbrook and even in West Rogers Park do not need to come into the building. They have their order. We have a client choice pantry. That is people get an order form and based on the size of their family, they get a number of points and can use them any way they want with the you know two or three pages of food, but also um, food stamps, which is now called SNAP, and you get a link card, um, only provides food. It does not provide hygiene products or um, cleaning products that were at a premium and that people really needed, especially during the pandemic. <laughs> so our food pantry also has toothbrushes and you know deodorant and cleaning products and baggies and foil and um, sunscreen and lip balm, things like that, that even if, that if you have uh, food stamps, you cannot use. You can only buy actual food. So we do that as well. We're also the only kosher food pantry in the Midwest that serves all Jews. There are, uh, there is another food pantry that serves Jews, but they only serve the Orthodox community. We serve everyone. Things like the the employment services and all of that are those in partnership with something like JBS or is that a separate That's something service? separate. Um, we would send anybody who um, is on disability. We will send to um, JBS because they have grants um, because they take government funds. They have grants that better serve people who are on disability. Um, we serve people who you know don't get disability. Um, they could be looking for part-time jobs because they have social security or they're looking for full-time jobs. Um, many of our clients might be employed, but they're underemployed. They are not utilized for the number of hours that they, they would prefer. Yes, go ahead. We may not get to all of it, but that's okay. We've covered quite a bit about clinical services and food pantry. So we also do have, I believe one of you said about a doctor. So at our West Rogers Park location, there is a medical, dental, optometry, sorry, there are offices for medical, dental, and optometry services. There is also a full service pharmacy. And am I correct? These are non-Medicaid clients? Um, well, if they, the right, for the pharmacy, it's people who have expensive uh, prescriptions. Um, sometimes people could be on Medicaid, but they get a prescription that Medicaid doesn't cover. So we will order it for them if we don't have it. Um, and there are many people that don't have the kind of insurance that they, that they require. Um, they might have it with very high deductibles. So we step in um, and provide medication. Even though we don't serve children under 18 directly, we will fill prescriptions for children we have the backpack school supply project for children. Hanukkah gift, gift wishes are for children. So um, we do serve children. We also um, seeing the mental health crisis in the schools. We are also going to take initiative in helping the day schools. They have approached us to help them access uh, mental health services for children and parents because so many are having difficulties during the pandemic. And as a result, not so much of being at home, but returning to school has created tremendous anxiety among children. We've never seen so many children that are you know, suicidal or harming themselves. And the teachers are overwhelmed and don't know what to do. And so we are paying for a lot of um, psychotherapy for children. Um, as well as uh, providing therapy for adults in the community too. For those that don't have um, insurance, we have some volunteer psychotherapists. We're also the only Jewish agency that has a psychiatrist 
um, even if people have Medicaid, there are dearth of providers that really take Medicaid. It's very full all the time. So we can provide that for the uninsured and people who just couldn't afford one. Um, and that's been very, very helpful. As far as the provider on staff, you have a internal medicine or a family practice? And we, right, we have the physicians, our volunteers, except for the psychiatrist who we pay and our dentist. Um, but the actual physicians that come in, we have internal medicine, gynecology, rheumatology. Um, you did, no, not the, uh, ophthalmology, no, no. So it, with, with the, what kind of diagnoses are you seeing? Well, I'm, I'm not in the medical clinic, but I can tell you that there are, are chronic issues okay. for most of the people that are coming to the clinic um, and they're not taking care of themselves. We found during the pandemic that yes, we lost a lot of clients to COVID, but we also lost clients um, for, who didn't have access to their primary care provider, didn't know that they could, could come to us assuming that they had to use their primary care provider. And we had people who, who lost their lives who just couldn't um, access Medicaid basically shut down during, you know, from April to July, it was in part of, two, uh, of 2020, it was very difficult to find a provider. So that if, was so, if somebody's not on Medicaid, do you get them signed up for Medicaid? Absolutely. Um, and then the, the type of illness, do you see like catastrophic type of illnesses? Or that we have, and then we will rush to try to get them on Medicaid or else link them up with Stroger. We've paid for x-rays and MRIs um, to do some basic diagnostics before we realize, you know, what we need to do for that person if they're going to need a lot of follow-up care and if it's a catastrophic illness. But a lot of them are due to chronic illnesses, you know, like, you know, diabetes and people just not taking care of themselves. We see the dental clinic actually began, again, because of the Russians, that their dentition was so poor that they couldn't find jobs. So that's how the dental clinic actually started was a request from employment. But now we see that there are a lot of people that really don't take care of their, their teeth and it re results in other types of diseases. So we encourage people to use our dental clinic. Jean, you have your digital hand up? Uh, yes, I do. I know of a situation where they're looking for a referral for a physician being on Medicaid. There aren't too many who accept uh, uh, Medicaid patients. Do you have any way of finding out who does? Absolutely. Well, when people sign up, for, when we help them sign up for Medicaid, we will also follow through with them, having them you know, pick a clinic, pick a provider, switch providers if they don't like the provider that they got. So it is part of the um, enrollment to choose a clinic. Um, some people, you know, don't actually access it or have difficulty and some people, especially with mental health issues, prefer to come to the art clinic because um, there's just less, less paperwork and bureaucracy and they feel very anxious about their health, so they feel more comfortable coming. But certainly the Affordable Care Act, the clinic was much more crowded before the Medicaid expansion. It used to be that, you know, if you were a poor person, um, you did not get um, Medicaid unless you were extremely impoverished and basically a mother with children. Now, of course, with the Medicaid expansion with Obamacare, um, more people have access to free health care than before. But we're still here for people who fall through the cracks and who need us because often of mental health issues. Do you collaborate with like Access or Erie Family Health? Yes. So they, they have a huge. They have a huge, but they have their catchment area. They have their what area? Their catchment area, meaning that they'll serve people in in, uh, in certain uh, in, geographies. In, absolutely. So if you if you have a client that's not in that geography, then they can't right. go to Erie, Erie Clinic. We have to find them another place based on uh, where they live. What percentage of the people that you see at ARC are um, immigrants? That might be a hard question. Yeah, but. no, I, I'd say, um, well, we have a Russian population. It tends to be mostly elderly, though there are families. We have some Ukrainian refugees, some people who wanted to rejoin family from Israel, um, who were initially in the former Soviet Union or even were in, in Israel. So they come also. Um, if somebody wants to come to the United States and need to be sponsored, 
well, then their sponsor needs to be eligible for our services because they've taken the responsibility of caring for them until they're on their feet. We will work with them, but um, but they have the, the whole family needs to um, be eligible. When you were asking about what do you think about ARC or what info, I thought it had to do with food distribution and immigrants. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't think very many American people. Right, and it's, it's mostly American. I mean, yeah. in the 90s, there was that influx where Hyas Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, part of JCFS now, was extremely active, and the ARC was very active. Right now, we have one um, Russian-speaking case manager. There was a time where we had two. There were so many people. Now, many of our Russian uh, clients are um, elderly Holocaust survivors. You know, the definition for a Holocaust survivor has expanded so that it includes those in the four areas of the former Soviet Union that were particularly beastly toward um, Jews in parts of Ukraine, Belarus. And there's actually a long chart with um, dates, locations and dates where that person would have had to be in the city, living in the city at that particular time in history. And then they would be considered a Holocaust survivor. Had you uh, do anything with the Survivor Mitzvah project at all? Are you familiar with that? No. It's a it's an enormous uh, international charity where. Are you talking about the blue card? No, it's oh. a Survivor Mitzvah project where they um, yeah, the money just goes to Holocaust survivors that are uh, you know living in poverty in, in like in Eastern Europe and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, well, people who are out of the country. It's, it's not part of our, our mission. Not part of your purview. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, uh, Ensure and Boost oral supplements, are, uh, it has to be fairly catastrophic, but it is covered 100% by Medicaid. It is, but some people are still having trouble accessing it, and we will carry it for people who need it. You say that a couple accessing it because they don't qualify? Right. Okay. There are people, right, exactly. And then that Ensure and Boost, that, uh, where do you guys get it? That I wouldn't be able to answer. I would be okay. the pantry person, but I could find that out. No, oh, just uh, our company sells it. We, I, oh, yeah. I could get you with like a 30% discount. Wow, that's great. Wonderful. <laughs> Please are writing for down a program. Your There's a sign right there. <laughs> um, excuse me. Thank you. I did want to mention about people coming from other countries. When we get volunteer applications, there is a question on there or applications for new volunteers to join us that says, How did you hear about the art? Because we do like to know, is it from a community program? Um, it's also a way for us to know if somebody might have been helped by the ARC in the past. And I have been struck that there have been more than a few people who say, when my family moved to the United States, but these are folks who are probably over 60, 65, but that they helped when we came to the right. state a fact, long time ago. Right. In fact, I remember during Parshat Noah, the portion of Noah, I spoke at my synagogue, which was Beth Hillel at the time, and um, my chazan came up to me um, after my presentation during the um, Kiddush and told me that he, in fact, his, his family had been helped, and he was a child, and he had been helped by the ark. Um, we actually have a couple board members who were ARC clients and came from the former Soviet Union as well. So someone who has been helped by another Jewish organization, right? You mentioned HIAS, um, but, but isn't Jewish, doesn't qualify at, as a client for ARC? Correct, if they're not, okay. right, right. So only... Right, um, but again... Um, you like know, loosely they, defined they, Jewish, right? Right, but, but if you know, but again, if they need a, a resource or uh, needed to come to the food pantry, right. in fact, the Rohingya um, community came to our food pantry um, a few years ago because they wanted to. They, their office and center was very close to us down to Bath, which is a huge immigrant area mm -hmm. right now, and they came to us and we helped them. Um, discuss how to set up a food pantry and re give them resources, yeah. which, you know, Chicago Food Depository, things like that. Go ahead. Sure. We're, we're 
powering through. There exist two programs that we haven't mentioned, and I think in the interest of time, I'll just mention them briefly, but we do have a full-time rabbi on staff. There is um, always opportunity for clients to connect with rabbi through groups, classes. He meets with individuals quite frequently, and I have to say, and Vicki has worked with Rabbi Tenenbaum far longer than I have, he does not there, there's nothing that he is not willing to help figure out. So even if it's something that is not maybe typically what our clinical services can offer or social services under that spiritual umbrella, including burials, funerals, helping families who cannot pay. That's right. The ARC will pay for funerals for clients, not only clients, but families, close family of clients as well. And unfortunately, we had twice as many funerals in 2020 as the previous year. And it's interesting, I had a friend call me and she has an aunt who is very close to losing a battle with cancer. And she said, this woman has less than no money. I don't know what to do. We can't pay for the funeral. And you know, it's not something that she would have called me about. She, we were just talking and I said, I don't know exactly, very new at the time. I don't know exactly what the parameters are, but I, I do think that she should call the ARC because here was somebody who was saying that burying a loved one, I think they were quoted eight or $10,000 is the minimal, minimal fee, even with Chicago Jewish funerals, even asking a favor of a friend. And I said, this will tank this family for six months. This is not, that something about the system doesn't feel quite right. And then I learned about um, Rabbi Tenenbaum and, and sometimes it's getting the help to get over the hump in that situation. Um, and, and he is just wonderful. And then the other um, program, if you don't mind, I was just gonna mention the, our intensive day program. We have, um, this is really a group of clients who have been coming into the ARC. Most of our clients, except for medical or dental have been virtual still. Um, our case managers are on the phone constantly. Right. <laughs> right, starting at the end of the summer, we began to open it for the intensive day program is for people who have chronic mental health issues, often very estranged from their families, um, often having no social supports. And they come throughout the day, there are groups and therapy and intensive case management. Um, and now they're back in, but for a few of the groups, especially the therapeutic arts group, like music therapy, we have a grant from the Institute for Therapy Through the Arts connected to the uh, Music Institute in, um, in Winnetka. And there are um, programs and uh, activities all day long. Um, and the rate of recidivism, that is those that have to be hospitalized, um, pl has plummeted through involvement with the intensive day program. And they've worked tirelessly to maintain contact during the darkest days of the pandemic when we weren't, we were open, but we weren't inviting people to come in except for, you know, to pick up money or a check or food, something like that. And I think when I think through the volunteer lens also, we have been talking with the intensive day program staff because we know that there are members of the community who have specialty skills that might be beneficial to the clients that are in these groups and programs because they might meet for an hour once a week. Um, an example is I just spoke with one of our um, case managers and she said, we've had a mindfulness group. The clients have really taken to this, but that instructor, I, I'm not sure of the situation, but they're looking for another instructor. And I said, could it be a volunteer? And she said, absolutely, because the staff is there with them. So I always like to mention this when we're with groups because even if it's not your job that you have you know, been working in out of your house or in an office for years and years, we all have things that we are passionate about. I grow food, Rabbi Rachel knows we talk tomatoes all the time. So I was thinking about, you know, in the spring, is there something where we can even bring supplies in and teach a little bit about the life cycle of a plant or, or growing vegetables, whatever it might be. So when we um, are, say that we have volunteer services, it is talking about groups that come into the pantry. A lot of people, when we say, what do you think of when you think of the art, they may, they may have been um, they may have been invited into the pantry to help sort through some of the food that gets donated at high holidays. I know Jeremiah has been wonderful about signs and the bags and we want people to pick them up and purchase the things that we need. 
but then something has to happen with that food. So actually today, we're not gonna rope anyone into it. We've got willing teams that are going to do this. We have a huge storage pod that's been delivered to the parking lot here. We are going to work with kids to bring bags and bags of food that was donated into this building to go through it in a way where we can sort what is kosher, what can we accept to put in another spot, what can we not accept? And we will get that probably to Niles Township or Moraine Township. We'll talk about where it's gonna go. Um, and then that food all comes directly back to the ARC. Then we have, stacy has been working also in the food pantry. We have staff and volunteers on that side that come into the pantry because somebody has to put all the food on the shelves. And it is really, as somebody who hasn't been there for quite as long to walk in and watch the, the mechanism that has to take place for clients to get their food including then somebody to take the food outside when they drive up or to volunteer to deliver to clients' homes. There are a lot of different steps that go into this. And I will say none of the thing, none of the programs or services that are taking place at the ARC, truthfully, I, I'm thinking quickly, I cannot think of one department where volunteer support wouldn't be impactful. So I always like to say that because sometimes people have one hour to give once a year and we are so grateful and welcoming and really do want people to get as involved as they would like. We have some people who email me because they're upset because when the sign up goes live um, through our website, <clears throat> they get an email about volunteering in the food pantry or to deliver the pantry items or deliver pharmacy items. It literally fills up in about three and a half minutes, I'm not exaggerating. And I have volunteers who are emailing me saying, I wasn't home, I didn't get the email. You need to book this person, they're signed up three times. It is a beautiful problem to have. And we're going to be thinking creatively even more so the way that um, Rabbi Rachel and Jeremiah have welcomed us in today also gets us thinking in our department because in April, we temporarily will be shutting the doors in West Rogers Park, not the the organization, just the physical space. We are beginning a 18 month, and I will say conservatively to two year um, renovation and expansion project. Um, there will be a capital campaign that is not public at this point. It's they're they're working in development to figure out all those steps. Neither of us, luckily, are uh, <laughs> too involved in that process. Well, I think so. Um, too involved in that process, but I'll show you a little bit. So we're also really trying to think about how do we maintain continuity if we're out of our building, even though many clients aren't coming in, we are providing so many services that are based in our building. So we are temporarily going to rehome the food pantry. We are going to rehome our offices and our case managers and our volunteer staff. We are going to find a space where volunteers could gather it, maybe a synagogue, it may be our temporary space that we are in. And all with the goal in mind of coming back to a space that is even more welcoming and supportive and dignified for clients. Um, so when we're thinking about not just sharing what we do at the ARC, but also providing, you know, mitzvah projects for kids going through B'nai Mitzvah class, what we're going out to it. Um, I can see if you want to come. We're going to work with four-year-olds in two weeks, actually, um, who want to learn about the ARC, about the kinds of people that we help, that it is the kind of people that they know and love, right? That it could be anybody. And they're doing a food drive. So they asked us to come and talk to them. So we're really looking at different ways to engage. Even something like that, a volunteer could come with us if they have an early childhood background. And I was showing Rabbi Rachel, I bought a book. I'm very excited. It says, it's called Saturday at the Food Pantry. We're not open on Saturday, but other than that, um, <laughs> right? Things that are relevant. So we're always willing to talk to small groups, large groups, parlor meetings, family gatherings. We are welcoming people to the pantry until March to do some food sorting on site. Let me help you out here. Okay, no, no, this is just one more I'm thing. Pausing. No, before, I want to mention Please. one more thing because I, I always forget. We have a homeless shelter. Oh, gosh. Um, that's uh, near the West Rogers Park location. Previous, prior to the pandemic, there were uh, 22 beds, double rooms, uh, different genders and different floors, families on the first floor. And they're, they're provided with three meals, kosher meals a day. They have their own case manager and can utilize all the services at the ARC. 
Um, the usual length of stay is about four months. And um, we will do intensive job hunting and trying to find um, housing. Um, and um, these are for people that really um, have no place to go. This may be a personal question, so just tell me if it is. For people who are at the intensive day program, are these primarily people who are able to care for themselves? Yes. I mean, okay, so they're- This is they're, right. These are people who have uh, emotional issues. Right. More psychiatric issues. But um, they're- But they're, um, you know, of, of normal, if not, you know, very high intelligence. Right. Um, we don't really serve, you know, a community that would be best served by Yahad or Libenu. I don't know those. Um, oh, the organizations that have our special needs organizations for children like and Hesha. adults, like oh, like Hesha. Hesha. Okay, yeah. right. No, and no. I, I was thinking more are um, people who are able to negotiate. Um, I don't know how to say this politely. Um, I'm thinking like these people are in good touch with reality. Yes, for the most yeah, part. Right. I mean, very. They can get from one place to get, another. On right. Their, they may become ill. Right. Um, and, you know, you have difficulty. Right, 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 right. Um, but nobody is, you know, actively psychotic. Yes, that, 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 that's where I was. Right. Yeah. No, no. Okay, good. Yeah. You know, we require people to, you know, work with, you know, their providers right. and be able to have a level of comportment right. where they'd be appropriate in the agency. Mm -hmm. In a group or something. That's different. right. Great. Do you have a minimum age of on-site volunteers? Sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, yeah, yeah, my boss is expecting me here to help with the food. Situation. And it's okay. You got to take the dishes too. Uh, yeah. Oh, thanks for the reminder. I'm going to take one more steak away just so you have it. It was nice to you. Yeah. You sure you don't don't that anyway. So thank you for, for coming. Thank you for, I also want to make sure that you guys get your, your break in between the session. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm just wondering for like the name it's uh, stuff. Yes. If you're taking on-site volunteers, is there a minimum age? So for the food pantry, the minimum age is five oh, on the weekends we because we will open, we have a couple of times that we're opening specifically for um, small groups that are coming in. How small is small? Uh, we need to keep it under 10 people. Okay. But we can do a couple of groups back to back and we do have a separate space. The reason I'm saying five is because it's dangerous. It's not because of Falling what they can and do. If parents are coming, I guess that's at their own risk. But from the COVID perspective, um, we want we people have, shots. What? You want vac vaccinated friends. Yes. The highest probability, and they would have to be masked. So with very young children, though, I will bring a car full of food bags over, let them take the stuff out of the bag, sort them. I found out we did this at Bethel um, for Sukkot. The kids that were the youngest, loved it the most. They were finding like things to put with like applesauce and, you know, putting all the applesauce. You forget that that's so, sorry. I know they do sorry. love that. Yes. Yes. Like that, all those good skills. Um, but honestly, Rachel, we are willing to create experiences, especially if people want to come in because we know that it's time limited for now. Um, and I actually, we have a couple of dates that we are, that we can um, schedule for some small groups so I can get those to you as well. Thank you. And thank you so much for the thank time. You for your and your thoughtful questions. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. This was very, very interesting. I have to go see if they need me in Sunday school. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Keep, keep yeah. doing what you're doing. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so, Jean and Aline, you have a very long trip home, meaning <laughs> you just need to turn off the computers. But I, again, thank, thank you for coming. Sorry that we had to run away to pick up kids and transition all the things. Um, but I, I definitely did not all know all of this. So. Well, I'm happy you're hearing it because I actually think, and we, Danny and I talked about inviting your staff and clergy group to the ARC. So I said, we were going to get to about it this week. And also the one other thing I need to mention, because you may not have been here. I don't know how many years, Rabbi, you've been here. Mm -hmm. When we were looking for a Northbrook location, oh. um, the only show that was willing to consider having us was Jeremiah. Oh, nice. Excellent. Well, I, I wasn't here at that point, but 
Um, so you it's like to marry on brand for Jeremiah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You like that. All right. Um, Thank you. But bye, Jean. Bye, bye, Lee. bye, Lee. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you both. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye.